On this special edition of Arts and Minds, Transformation AGO, an exclusive behind the scenes look at the Art Gallery of Ontario. It's been redesigned, remodeled, and renovated by world renowned architect, Canadian Frank Gehry. I just went back to the classical, symmetrical entrance that I remembered as a kid. It's a $254 million project, seven years in the making. The way the building looks from the outside is absolutely an expression of what had to happen on the inside. The reopening of a building that has been anxiously anticipated by art lovers across the nation. Contemporary art has this sort of privileged position being elevated into the city, forward looking, possibly even into the future. Over the next half hour, we are going to bring you an exclusive sneak peek look at one of the most important art collections in the world, the Thompson Collection, plus brand new work in the contemporary galleries. All of this in this amazing building that some people are calling a work of art in itself. But don't tell that to Frank Gehry, because he hates it when you say things like that. My name is Felibrat, and I landed on Juno Beach with the Queen's Own Rifles of Canada, and our B Company drifted in front of a German pillbox, and it caused heavy casualties before they finally knocked it out. If you're a veteran of the Second World War and want to share your story, please contact The Memory Project. Join the legacy. <laughs> For more than 50 years, Chow Quen Lee has lived in Canada. She's yet to call it home. She still harbors resentment towards the Canadian government for the many years she was barred from joining her husband here. My mother was separated uh, because of the Chinese head tax and, and many of the Exclusion Act was separated from, from, from my father for 20 years. Yu Li is one of Chao Quan Li's four children. They weren't allowed to come together. So my mother raised two children in China for most of that 20 years during war, famine. In 1885, Canada wanted to reduce the number of Chinese immigrating to the country, so the federal government imposed a Chinese head tax. It started at $50 and jumped to $500 by 1903. At the time, $500 was about two years' salary for the average Chinese worker. In early 1994, Dallaire met an informer who told him about the growing stockpile of weapons. He faxed UN headquarters in New York, warning that he intended to grab them. I wrote the fax that night, and all I was doing is not saying, do I have permission to do I was simply informing them of another phase of the operation. But the UN ordered Dallaire to leave the weapons untouched. Dallaire's mandate required him to be utterly impartial. I was beyond myself. I could not comprehend the narrow, narrow interpretation which they reminded me of uh, in their response. It, it just seemed ludicrous. Behind the scenes at UN headquarters, the United States put intense pressure on Security Council members to stay out of Rwanda. They were worried that I was going to get sucked into a trap and then create a catastrophic scenario. Washington was still haunted by its public failure in Somalia. They would not risk another quagmire in Africa. And so the Security Council said all the right things, but did little else. The Security Council demands that the interim government of Rwanda and the Rwandese Patriotic Front take effective measures to prevent any attacks on civilians in areas under their control. Diplomatic language from New York had no effect on tribal factions in Rwanda. As the genocide spread, European troops arrived not to save Africans, but to get European civilians out to safety. I had only 45 minutes notice that they were coming in. And there was no way that anybody wanted to talk to me about the possibility of, you know, shifting these troops around. 
absolutely no way. They were committed to get all the white people out. And that's what they did.